Hey kids and welcome to the Styles from Wriggling Harking Tutorial Ringing Guide. Today's episode is going to be advanced ordering. First ordering episode, we just talked about what was in front and what was behind and using our composite or our timeline, not our timeline, or the Z axis to organize things from front to back. In today's episode, I want to talk about the order of operations if you're stacking pegs like this. And I frequently emphasize that you want to start at the top of your rig and work your way down because if you had a master peg, something that was controlling a bunch of different stuff and you squat down here and then you need to squat up here again, you'll have to unsquat this one. So if you start at the top, you'll, you'll never have to counter animate something that you've already done. And it's just a much better way to work in general. But today I want to look at the actual order. If you have a bunch of pegs like this to separate translate scale and rotate so you can determine which one's happening first. Because inside a peg, it doesn't seem to work in the like in the order that it's suggesting here. Position, scale, rotation. S rotation seems to happen before scale. So that's not super clear what's happening when or I maybe it all happens at the same time. I'm not exactly sure how a single peg determines the order of operations. And I don't think there's any way to change that inside of the peg. There's nothing that pops out to me. Maybe smarter people have found a way. But there's times when you want to make sure that your scale is happening first and you rotate second. So here, if we want our wheel to move and we can just add a rotation. We add a rotation and our guy can now roll along. But let's say we want to push that into perspective. So I've added a scale peg here. I'm going to turn off my little running man so I can do all keyframes at one time and just squish this guy like this. And now my guy is still rolling away, but it's happening in perspective. Here's the thing. If you take this scale and you put it below the rotate, now we're getting this. And that's what would happen. You just take these out. We just did this on a single peg and we rotated and then used our alt keyframes to scale that. Then we're going to get that wonky wheel effect. So that's why I think the rotate happens before the scale, despite the fact that they're listed here scale first. But I mean, I don't know, I make it up as I go. So now we've got our little wheel going in perspective and we can translate that. Eee. And if we wanted to, we could even shrink it down on this peg. So now it's moving away from us in perspective with very little work on our part. If we used a single peg for this, because you could see that like wibble wobble that the wheel was doing, it's going to take a lot more effort than this little cheap gimmick here. So this is one instance where you would want to work from bottom up because now if I rotate this, we're gonna get a weirder thing. So if you were doing something, oh, that's cool. So if you wanted to do a wagon wheel like this, then you have to rotate first, then scale it, and then translate it to get it working. If I take this translate and move this down below the scale, that's still working. So we've got a little bit of flexibility there. But if we pop the translate down below the rotate and the scale, then we're going to get this which in some situations you might want. If something's flying down a vortex, for example, then this would get you the, the movement easier than hand animating, unless you used a 3D peg, 3D path. Oh, this happens to be a 3D path. Interesting. Wee See what happens if we make this a 2D path. I didn't even realize I was using those separate. So we'll clear out all our keys. So we're going to do a rotation first. It's all keyframes mode, put our scale in second, and then our translate. Wee and now if we put our translate on the bottom, we're still getting that loop-de-loop, -loop, even though it's a 2D peg or a 3D peg. So in both position 3D path and separate, it's still important that you get the order of those right. That's one of the things that can be really frustrating, of course, for baby animators. But it really is just a situation where you have to practice doing this stuff. Just work with a very simple thing like a ball or a wheel and then try and get it doing a few different things and playing with the order of these and then switch the order around and see how that affects it. Because if we drop the scale down below the rotate now, we're going to get that wobbly wheel. And if we put that above the translate, it works fine. The more that you animate, the more you get a workflow that you know isn't going to cause you problems down the line. The next step in this advanced ordering is to throw in an apply peg transformation. So what this does is it creates a top peg on the bottom, if that makes sense. So instead of adding a peg right here, that can now do additional things. Maybe you need to move it in the scene or something, have a different position. You don't want to muck up your keys that are working really well. But instead of doing that, you can put a peg down here in the first slot. So we have two greens and a blue. The first green is the peg place. So I put the peg here and I can move everything around and it's going to act just like a top peg would. The second one sort of acts as a peg bypass. So if I needed to put this translate between the scale and the rotate, 
but I couldn't actually put it in there for some reason, then I could plug it in here and then plug the scale in here. And now it's going to happen between the scale and the rotate. So that could get strange things happening. And if you see, if I'm animating this around, my box is moving at a different rate than my wheel is because the translate, the, this peg is happening in the middle here. And if I just throw some keys on there, just for funsies, let's see. Yeah, so it seems to be doing what I expect it to do. And if we plug the rotate in the bottom, then we're going to get a big loop-de-loop -loop guy because it's happening. It's like shoving it in between the rotate and the test. So that's the simplest way I can describe this. Wherever you want to plug this in, say I want to plug it in the middle, then the one above it, instead of going down, would go into the bypass port or the insertion point, the insertion point they call it transformation insertion point that's super clear Just to plug the required peg into the insertion point <laughs> i've never actually used this for anything it's just never come up maybe someone has some use for that but i've never come across one this port however millions of things we could do with this one thing is if we have two items so maybe we've got these two guys we have this guy pulled in here as a cutter for example and it was set up there so that it grabbed the scale of this because it needs to follow everything up to this. And we need to move all of this, but not this guy. So we need to put a peg here, boop, and move this, but it's moving this guy too and we can't have that. So that's when an apply peg transformation would come in. We need to add a top peg without affecting something else. And we could throw this guy in here. And if it was acting as a cutter, it would actually take that cutter with it. So even though this guy isn't moving at all, it's still going to take this information because it's happening above the apply peg transformation. Hopefully that makes sense. It will take anything that's plugged into this pooping port and it will take it with it, including stuff that's coming from outside of this direct hierarchy. Um, my favorite thing to do with this is shadows and lighting effects. So if we had this was a ball boop, and we needed a lighting effect, what we could do, plug this in twice and go to our node library. And we could use a bunch of different stuff, uh, color override, transparency to get different things going on. I'm going to use color scale because it's the easiest thing to visualize. So here I could change the hue and just change it to whatever. Change it. That looks pretty. Okay, so now we've got this guy and we've got this guy. And now I'm going to, I want to make sure that this is always visible when it's over top of this. This is boop. So I'm going to make sure that this is an inverted cutter for this. So whenever this guy is within the realm of this guy, it's visible. And then I can use the apply peg transformation up here. I can move this around. I'm going to actually switch the color scale to the back so that the main color is visible and that this other one is sort of acting as a rim light. And this is the easiest way to get volume shadows. And we can even throw a blur in here before the cutter. This is another example of where order is important. So here, if I put the blur before the cutter, it's being blurred and then cut by the circle. But if I put the blur below, then the, it's being cut, it's being blurred after it's cut. So it's going all the way around. So the order is important here. So here it's blurred, then cut. And of course, because the anti-aliasing, it's never going to be super perfect. We could try thickening up our circle. Yeah, if we, if we thicken up our circle a bit, just by plugging it a bunch of times or using a mat resize, that'll clean up this exterior seam. But here's a super simple rim light that could be animated. So if your light is passing behind the character, you can do that. And of course, this color scale could be used to make any other sort of color. So if you needed this kind of color or you needed a shadow, so we could even like oh, let's throw a color card in there. So we could use this to create a little bit of a, a shadow. Highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow. You could also use a second color scale on the first one. So if you were doing an underwater scene, what I would like putting the blue up a bit, saturation down a little bit. And it's not very good color to do this with. Yeah, so whatever your your tone happens to be that you're working with, it will just change those to the percentage. And you can see some colors work better. Sometimes it works better than other times, but that's something you play around with your color scales to get exactly what would work for that particular color. Okay, so I wanted to throw in my complex character just to show you. Got our color scale, shadow in the back, and have the head plugged in so that it's always visible. 
like that. And if you're using a complex character, like with the ball, it doesn't matter if you throw it in the left or the right port. Here you have to make sure that your apply peg transformation is on the cutting one and not the visual one. Because if you're moving this one around, it's going to cause a lot more problems. So now we can do this and we're getting a little bit of a rim light and the blur can still go on here. Uh, separating, getting this bit of a rim light is a lot more complicated because you need to actually separate this ear as well and then have two of them going through different lighting situations. Top tier pain in the bum. But for a pretty simple thing like this and it's animatable. And then if we switch our color scale, then we've got a shadow and we might want to make our color scale a little bit more saturated so it's not so ugly. So you can get either a rim light or a shadow using the same simple effect. It's just important that the, the apply peg goes into this side and it will work on the different views. Some views you might have little artifacts from the blur because the way the blur works is it, it's a gradual transparency. So you'll be getting the pieces behind showing through and it's pretty simple to fix that. You want to add just a composite between here and here. That's a bitmap and it's going to just flatten that before it goes through. So of course the only issue if you throw a bitmap in here is you may end up having some layering issues that you have to address. But usually if you're using this type of setup, it comes at the very end of the entire character. So if you have two characters that one has its arm wrapped around the other, and you need to use this bitmap to clean up some of your stuff here, that might end up causing problems be with the interaction between that character. You, you may actually need to put this inside of the group. Here you've got your character template. So you may need to put the lighting inside the group so that the head has its own lighting, the lower body has its own lighting. If you need something like the arms to go ahead or you're really dependent on that Z for some reason. But usually you'd put the lighting at the very bottom of the character. And as long as it's not wrapping around another character in the scene or something, then the lighting would, you'd be able to like sneak in this bitmap comp. Um, it's one of those things that once you have a problem, you try and solve it when you get there because different solutions for different problems. But I mean, if you need a cheap light. And the last thing I want to go over, go to our library and I'm going to grab a shadow module. Now, this is different from like the tone shaders or the tones, the shadow module itself. We can grab that. So it already comes with its own little blur, depending on how blurry you want that. Not, we have to actually render it. Do We can change that to whatever color we want. So if we, we don't necessarily need to use this for just a regular shadow, we could uh, do tinted colors and stuff if we have neat lighting situations. And we could use the source color if we wanted to do that. Maybe it was like glass, it was somewhat transparent. So all those options are there in the shadow that are fun. And now instead of a peg, what I'm going to do is grab a quad map. So a quad map, if I press shift F11 or I go to view, show, controls, it's going to give me the control handles for my quad map. And it's just a one, two, three, four peg. And inside the source point, that's where it initially comes in. I find using, actually trying to use these to put your quad map in a more convenient position tends to break it. I wouldn't even bother. And then the destination point, this is acts just like the transformation in the peg. So if I move one, it's going to put X and Y information on one and down the line there. And then the pivot point, you can move it just like you would using an offset using your rotate tool. So if it's, it's just like a quad peg and we could use that to make a ground shadow pretty easily. So even if my wheel is moving along, I can animate my quad map. And so now it's going to follow along and the perspective of it is going to change based on what you put here. So here, if I do the light like that, copy the information there. So we might need to switch the perspective here a little bit and we can get all kinds of useful shadows out of it. Boop. And I'm going to can render that. All right, so now we have our ball rolling away and we've got a little bit of a shadow. Easy peasy just by throwing this quad map in. So it's shift F11 to get the points and then you just treat it like a, a peg, just grabbing these little handles and you can get all kinds of fun stuff out of it. And now through the magic of television, I can show you an advanced example of that. Here I've taken the wheel that we've done earlier and he's rolling across the screen and we've got two different perspectives on the shadow. I can show you the setup here. So it's exactly what we had up here. And this time I plugged it in three times. So on the front, we have just the regular wheel, then shadow one, 
is this one on the ground and it's got its own quad map. You can see here like that going across. And then this one on the upper wall has its own quad map going this way. Each one is just being projected separately. And then I have a cutter, which is just this wall, the line on the wall. The overlay is the top part and the color art is the bottom part. So each cutter is only displaying the particular shadow that needs to be shown on each part of the wall. And then I can automatically, any animation I do to this is automatically going to cast the shadow across two surfaces with a reasonable amount of quality. So here I'd need to use my quad map to line it up a little bit better. But overall, you're getting some pretty nice looking shadows for very little effort, just having to animate these little quad maps. And we can render that one. So hopefully your stuff is coming along and you're getting some fun ideas of what you can add to your own scene. Just practice playing around with the order of operations and the order of pegs that you have and uh, see what kind of stuff you can come out with. And this apply peg transformation is really cool once you get to know how to use it. It's not, it does have a lot of utility for compositing specifically, but it's good in a pinch. If you're having Z problems, you can use this to kind of force everything on composite to go to a particular Z level. But I think shadows are really where the apply peg kicks the most bum. All right, so thanks for dropping by. If you know anybody who could stand to learn a little bit more about Harmony, please share with them. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.